So I made the decision. We're heading in to the emergency room. And now I have a problem. I just realized that I can't find my health card. So without my health card, I have to pay for this visit and hopefully try to get reimbursed. Hola amigos, Daniela here from Through the Looking Glass. Welcome back to my channel. Welcome to my channel if you're new here. In this channel, I talk about living your best life while chronically ill. Today, I want to share you the story where I had to go to the emergency room because of a migraine. Some of you may know I suffer from chronic migraines. I had a concussion about four years ago and ever since I have migraines every single day, no exception. I am under the care of a neurologist. We've approached several different treatments. I have tried Botox injections, magnesium infusions, ketamine and lidocaine infusions, you name it. I tried preventative medications. Those didn't work well for me. I had a reaction to them, so I can't be on those medications. So the only thing left for me are the abortive medications. Those are medications that you take when you have a migraine, the preventative ones you take it to avoid getting them and the abortive ones you take it once the, you start feeling a migraine coming on, you take them and they're supposed to stop the migraine. So you're not supposed to take those very often. I think it's maximum of 10 a month. Uh, if you're having more than 10 migraines a month, you're supposed to be on the preventative uh, medications, which I can't be on. So I pretty much take every day the abortive medications and my doctor knows about that he knows it's not ideal but it is the only thing that works for me now having said that it doesn't mean that it completely aborts the migraine or leave me completely pain-free those abortive medications sometimes work really well and they completely take the migraine away and i can just carry on with my day other times it just brings it down to a more manageable level so i still feel a lot of the other effects of the migraine that is not just the pain i still feel the nausea the dizziness the blurred vision the light sensitivity sound sensitivity uh, smell sensitivity um, so it still impacts me but the pain is brought to a manageable level and then there's some times that doesn't work at all and so it happened that I was into day five, five or six maybe, of um, migraine that was not responding at all. I had used everything that I have at home from anti-inflammatories, regular painkillers, narcotics, um, the abortive medications, everything and, and gravel for the, for the nausea. I was using and taking everything that I had my hands on nothing was happening nothing it wasn't the worst pain i've ever had it wasn't my worst migraine but it was high enough that it was impacting my ability to just live life i didn't want to get out of bed i was having trouble eating i was having trouble sleeping i can do this for a few days but when you hit like day four day five and you don't see an end to it it's almost like you get into that vicious cycle where you are so tense and you're in so much pain and that triggers more pain so tension triggers pain pain triggers tension and you kind of like you get caught in that and you can't break that cycle i am trying to decide if i should go to the emergency room going to the emergency room they can give you something that they call um, a migraine cocktail it's a combination of different medications uh, it often includes a anti-inflammatory a steroid uh, narcotics and it kind of like it addresses the pain that you're feeling at the moment but it also works in a deeper level where it kind of breaks that cycle and so it, I can only get this from my emergency room. There is no walk-in clinics. There is no other medical facility that gives that kind of treatment. And so you're asking, so what's the problem with going to the emergency room? Well, first of all, I feel very, very guilty to go to the emergency room if it's not like a true emergency you know like you're bleeding out you've been in an accident or you're having an allergic reaction it's a decision that i'm making 
that I reached a point where I can't take it any longer. And I keep asking myself, like, can you or can you not? Can you push it another day? I've been thinking about going since yesterday, but I don't think I was at the point where I was so desperate that thinking of spending seven hours that uncomfortable, like, I know it will get worse for sure before they can give me the drugs and get better just because of the environment I'm gonna be in. Not to mention that it may trigger the fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia flare, and you know, so it goes. So I have this struggle where I'm always trying to downplay my pain and not validating how much I'm suffering and always questioning. So it's so hard to decide when it's not an emergency, when I'm not having like an anaphylaxis reaction that you have to go, you have no option, you're taken by ambulance, but when it's your decision, it is just so hard. And I always feel <clears throat> I don't want to waste the nurse's time or hospital staff and room, so I'm always questioning myself, am I bad enough? Am I in enough pain to justify going? <laughs> and I always, so, I always downplay my pain. And I know I need to go in. The other aspect is how difficult it is to actually get to the point where you get treatment. So there is a huge wait our, in our emergency room. Waits can be up to six hours to even see a doctor. What happens is you first come in to the emergency room and you have to wait in line. So they don't have a system with a number where you grab a number and then you can go sit at a chair. You have to hold your spot in a line. And if you're really sick, they may get a, a wheelchair for you. But if not, you just stand there. And then you get to the triage. So you get seen by the first triage nurse where they ask you uh, what the reason for your visit is, your symptoms, and a few other questions. They take your vitals. And what's your main complaint today in two to three words? I'll get the rest of the story in a moment. Um, my brain that is not uh, responsive to medication. Do you have to lower your mask for a moment, please? Under your tongue, and close. And your pain right now out of 10, 10 is the worst, zero is nothing. It's a seven episodic eight. Thank you very much. Have a seat outside of one of those chairs, but call your name and I'll get you registered, okay? Thank you. No problem, I hope you feel better. Thanks. Thank you. No problem. And then they send you back out uh, to that room that you were originally, but now you can actually sit down. You don't need to wait in line because you have been put into their system. So the second stage is the registration stage. So you get called out again and you go into this other room and they will ask your address, your health card number, phone number, next of kin, all that information. They'll put a file together for you and they'll give you this file and then you go into the ER itself now. Um, do you have a health card? No, I've lost my health card. You lost it? I think I did. I used it at my family doctor the last time yeah. and it was about a month and a half ago and I could not okay, find what's it. What's your date of birth? So now you have to put your file in a basket by the nurse's station and then you get to go out into this hall where you wait and there is your biggest wait. So from the point where you first started to line up to the point where you're actually inside the ER waiting could be a couple of hours, one to two hours. And then once you're in there and you're in this hallway that, let me tell you, have the worst chairs I've ever seen in my life. And honestly, like the people that are there are people who are sick, are people who are in pain, are people who are injured, and they have to wait for hours on those hard chairs. There are women with babies there. And oh, it's, it's just awful. It's, it's an awful experience. And uh, you can wait there another two to four hours. Then you get called by the ER nurse. So you go in and they will again 
take you take the reason why you're there and your symptom then they make their notes they do another set of vitals and then she says okay you you're ready to be seen by the doctor and you wait another bunch of time and then the doctor comes and calls you okay so i'm dr parker so, my name is so during this entire time there is no privacy there is nowhere where you can just be in pain when you are in pain you are so vulnerable you want to moan you want to move you want to cry you just want to do what you need to do to cope with what's going on and while you're waiting in the emergency room it's like you're on display for everybody to see like there's no privacy whatsoever so this is the first time that we actually go into a room that has a door with some privacy so the doctor comes in, he's only in for a few minutes, but he's very pleasant. He asks, you know, what's going on, when did the symptom starts and all that. He could see that I had a history, that I had been at that particular hospital several times already for the same reason, for migraines. So I, I saw that you, um, you've been here a few times uh, for migraines yeah. and received some IV medication. Mm -hmm. That's been helpful. Sometimes, not always. You really sort of have these sort of almost daily problems, right? Oh, they are daily. And do you see, have you seen a neurologist? Oh, yeah. I'm over okay. here. We've done a bunch of treatments. I've done Botox. I've done magnesium okay. infusions. Okay. So you've been there, done that. So, oh, yeah. I mean, essentially, from our, from our perspective, the only thing really to do or try is the IV. Then you leave that room and you go back into the hallway or sort of this multi-purpose room and you wait until the nurse comes and calls you. And then they start an IV. And again, they, they do it right in the middle of the hallway. There is no room that you go in, there's no privacy. She starts an IV and then she starts the medication. Then they send you into this treatment room, which is basically one large room that has several lazy boy chairs. And you just lay there while your IV is dripping. Now, this sitting for hours on those hard chairs and being in pain and being tense. Now, not only I have this worse migraine, I also have my fibromyalgia flared up. My back is absolutely killing me. All the nerves on my body are flared up and I am in agony until the drugs start to kick in. So at one point, uh, the pain subsided a little bit. It didn't go away completely, but it started to change. It started to change from that throbbing and sharp piercing pain from the migraine to more of like a tension headache. I was feeling it a lot on my face and my forehead. And I am very, very sensitive and I'm very sensitive to wearing a mask. Whenever I wear a mask, just having that pressure applying here on my cheekbones, it triggers my trigeminal nerve and I start to get a lot of pain on my face and my forehead. And I think that that's what was happening. So it, the migraine itself was subsiding, but then I was starting to get other kind of pains, the fibromyalgia pain and the trigeminal nerve pain. So. The doctor came back in and checked on me and I said, listen, no, I'm not pain free. It's not completely gone, but I think it, it is gone enough that I can go home. And those drugs, some of the drugs that they use, they not just work right there and then they continue to work for the next 24 hours and they help break that cycle of the nerves firing. And I told him, I said, at this point, I think I'm better off going home and having a hot bath and just laying in a dark room um, and allow those drugs to finish their work because I don't think you can do anything else for me here. And I'm just going to be aggravating other conditions that I have and flaring up other conditions. So he agreed and he decided to let me go. And then it took probably another half an hour still for the nurse to come and take my IV off. And, uh, and then I was able to go home. Now, during this entire time, I think the whole process, it was about seven hours, um, eight hours between coming and going, uh, driving from home. And during this whole time, I had nothing to drink. I had nothing to eat. I wasn't dehydrated because I did have an IV uh, for part of it at least. But once the nausea had subsided, once the medications that they gave me for nausea kicked in, the hunger kicked in. So we're heading home. It is 
exactly eight hours from when we arrived. Anyways, I'm not completely pain free. It's better. It changed from that throbbing, stabbing pain to more like a hangover feeling, like a pressure on my head and a frontal like tension headache. So the medication they gave me, uh, the doctor said that it continues to work. So for the next 24 hours, it should sort of break more that cycle of the migraine. So hopefully it will have been worth it coming because it is not fun. But I think it was the, the right call because I just couldn't do another night like the other ones. This was already like eight o'clock at night and I hadn't eaten anything all day. So my husband and I ordered some sushi online and it was ready when we got home. It had already been delivered. And so we had a little kind of picnic in bed. No time to cook dinner tonight. So I called, was it skip the dishes? And little happy time. Sushi time. Ate sushi together. That was a, a nice little moment that we had together. And, uh, and then I went to sleep. And I woke up this morning completely migraine free. Completely. I cannot remember when was the last time that that happened. I have not taken any medication whatsoever since the drugs they gave me at the hospital. I have not taken anything here at home. And we'll see, we'll see if that's going to give me a few days break, but in the least it will get me back into my routine of taking my abortive medication and working, or at least most of the time working. This is the life of a chronic ill person. I had plans for yesterday and you just have to cancel it, you know, like even the days before there were like things that I needed to do, I had plans, I had projects and that migraine was so uncontrollable that I could do nothing but lay in bed. And it, that's the nature of living chronically ill. I think that's one of the most difficult things is that you are not reliable, you can't count on your health, you can't count on being able to do things. You make all those plans and then you have to change. You have to adapt, you have to be patient, and yeah. That's just how it is and I'm still learning. I'm still learning to be patient. And so I just wanted to share this story with you of how hard it was for me to make that decision of going to the emergency room, not only because of justifying the use of those resources, but also knowing that I was going to have to wait for so long and I was going to be so uncomfortable and that it was going to flare all my other conditions and that my migraine was going to get worse before they could actually do something about it to get better. And I just keep pushing and pushing and pushing and thinking I can do another day, I can do another day. But at one point I have to stop and I have to accept that I deserve help and not keep downplaying my pain and my suffering. So this was my story about my trip to the emergency room because of a migraine. Please like, subscribe if you enjoyed this video and I'll see you next week. Ciao for now e até a próxima!